Hello, and welcome to Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Jen Liebman with Fraud Magazine, and today I'm joined by John Warren, CEO of the ACFE, to talk about our most scandalous frauds of 2023. So hi, John, how are you? I'm good, Jen, how are you? I'm doing well. So to start, I thought we'd talk a little, you know, background on our most scandalous frauds list, why we do it every year, and, you know, tell listeners a little bit about how the scandalous fraud sausage is made. You know, we started doing this in 2018, which was like a pretty big year for fraud. We had the SEC charged Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani for defrauding investors about their blood testing machine. We had like Danska Bank CEO resigning over, you know, a money laundering scandal. There was that, you know, the Punjab National Bank scandal. And of course, there was also the former Malaysian prime minister who was arrested for corruption in his role in the one Malaysia development scandal. So, John, why do you think it's important that we compile these big frauds every year? Yeah, well, um, I think their number is, first of all, it's amazing what a big fraud year 2018 was. I'd kind of forgotten about that. But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's important for a few reasons. Um, one is just awareness. You know, one of the things we preach at the ACFE is that the, the key to fighting fraud is really awareness. I mean, at their, at their heart, all frauds are crimes involving a breach of trust, right? Which means that if you know the fraud is coming, if you're aware of the possibility of fraud, you're much less likely to be victimized. So I think raising awareness is always something we focus on. Um, the more we're aware about risk, the better we are able to protect ourselves. But I think um, large scandalous frauds in particular, uh, they give us an idea of the kinds of risks uh, that might be out there. Sometimes these are novel frauds. It's new risks. So we want people to be aware of those. Sometimes they're really big frauds and, you, you know, there are obviously special lessons you can learn from really big frauds. You, you want to examine, like, how did that occur? You want to under, understand what the weaknesses were, what the vulnerabilities were so that we can, you know, obviously uh, prevent those from happening again. And so at the end of the year, you know, we're closing the books on 2023. It's kind of a good time, a natural time to, to look back at what happened throughout the year um, in terms of fraud and fraud cases, see what we can learn, what we can understand. The other part of it is, uh, and it's probably, I don't know if this is a weird thing for for me and my position to be saying, but it's just kind of fun yeah, to really uh, <laughs> look, at the, look at the biggest frauds, right? Like obviously we feel terrible for the victims and you know, you have a sense of contempt for the fraudsters, but at the same time, there's a, there's sort of a prurient interest in seeing just what, was the the giant fraud? What was the big scandal? It's kind of the Us Weekly version of uh, the, yeah. <laughs> the ACFE news in, in a way, and it's it's like a car crash. Even though you know it's terrible, you kind of can't look away. Um, but I do think there's an educational component of it too, mm -hmm. as well. So you know that's why we do this. It's one of our favorite things to put out every year. Excited to to drop the 2023 um, list. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say for myself, because I've been doing this scandalous frauds for a few years, it really is like my favorite part of the job. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, <laughs> I, I would never go, I would never say you admire these people, right? They're horrible, no. horrible people, but the frauds themselves are pretty interesting. And if you're in our industry, there is um, a natural interest in seeing like, how did this work? How did it happen? There's always stuff you can take away from them. Yeah. So what is your definition of a scandalous fraud? Well, I think that it's the definition is kind of a moving one. And I think picking them is a little more art than science. But you're basically looking at something that's kind of shocking to the system. And that could be there's a number of ways we look at these. Right. As you know, um, it's it can be how much news coverage did it get? Was it something that was really dominating the headlines? Because, you know, that obviously is kind of what a scandal is. Um, but it's also did it involve somebody who's really high profile? Did it involve a large organization, something that, you know, is newsworthy in that way? Um, was it a big dollar loss, right? We don't only look at the biggest frauds of the year that sometimes that, you know, those are, those kind of tend to be the same over and over again, but big dollar loss is obvious, obviously a consideration. And so is uh, the number of victims, how many people were harmed by it. Um, but generally 
Oh, the other thing I would say is, was there something new or novel about it? You know, when we look back at like Enron, for instance, you know, I don't think anybody really knew what a special purpose vehicle was before the Enron fraud happened, or at least the general public didn't. And so that's, you know, it's not that that was a new concept in, you know, legal or accounting circles, but it became this thing that everybody's like, well, what is this? What is an SPV? And uh, so that is, that is a way that a fraud can be scandalous, but basically it gets back to is it shocking in some way or is it newsworthy in some ways? That's what we're really looking for. Yeah. I mean, I know that when I'm kind of surveying the news for these big frauds, I'm always, you know, I'm looking at the victims, you know, how, how were they affected in what way? And that's kind of my, that was really like a measuring stick for me when looking for frauds this year was just like, how were people affected? And there were some cases that we had that were people, there were like tons of people who were just really hurt by these frauds. So that was like a major thing that I was thinking about this year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think maybe we should, you know, just start digging into our list of most scandalous frauds. Um, so, of course, the biggest fraud this year was FTX. Sure. And, you know, even though this case broke late last year, right after we had published our 2022 list, um, we still had, like, most of 2023 to follow the case. You know, we had this trial. We had Sam Bankman frieds trial and his eventual conviction. So, John, what made this our biggest scandal of the year? Yeah, and I think even though you're right, even though the fraud came to light in 2022, it kind of dominated the the fraud news in throughout 2023 as we learned more about the case and as as we got into the trial and so forth. Before we jump into that, I do want to just give a shout out to you and the rest of our communications team because you guys are the ones for the folks listening. Um, our communications team spends you know, the year delivering fraud news to members through, you know, fraud magazine or through our newsletters or our blogs or a number of different channels. They're the ones who really track these things, put together a list so that we're able to narrow it down to um, what is eventually our, our top five for the year. But the FTX one in particular was kind of a no brainer uh, for, for fraud of the year. I mean, there's a number of factors. The first thing is just the size of it. Uh, you know, FTX, Shortly before it all unraveled, was valued at something around thirty-two billion dollars. It was the one of the three or four largest uh, crypto exchanges in the world. More than a million investors. There was serious venture capital money flooding in. It was this. It was the hot new thing. Also, something that really makes it noteworthy is that it was built around cryptocurrency, and that is there's still a bit of a wild west component to the crypto market. I think, right. There's um, mm -hmm. regulation in that arena, as we've learned probably isn't as, as uh, detailed or as thorough as it is in other financial markets. And, and there's an element of the unknown to it, right. A lot of people still don't really understand crypto. And, you know, when we see these news reports uh, of other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin or whatever, having these skyrocketing values and these big uh, troughs and, and, I think there there is like this component of it. We don't really understand what's happening here. So then when you see this major crypto exchange collapse, there's a lot of natural curiosity about that. Mm -hmm. What happened? What was the cause? What, what did we miss? Um, the third thing is just the founder himself, Sam Bankman fried You mentioned him. He's the one who just recently got convicted. He's just such a unique character. You know, he was at one point the richest um, person in the world under the age of 30. I've seen reports of his yep. personal net worth valued anywhere from, from like 16 to $26 billion before the age of 30. He's 31 when the whole yeah. thing collapses. He just, he's out of central casting, right? He's got the big, uh, the big sort of unkempt hair and he wears shorts everywhere. And he, he just kind of, he looks like the prototypical sort of internet nerd, but he becomes kind of the face of, crypto right mm -hmm. and he's he's out in front he's uh giving lots of money to politicians he's bringing in celebrities to endorse uh ftx he's they're getting naming rights to the miami heat arena right he's sort of high profile 
in a way that maybe other people in the industry aren't. And then, so when it unravels, he's this natural focus point, right? Where everybody can look at him and be like, okay, we know that guy. And now it's all collapsing around him. Uh, the fourth thing I would say, and there's, there's like, it's kind of the perfect fraud in a lot of ways, but the fourth thing is just how fast it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, it was at the end of October, 2022, FTX is this behemoth. And then early November, I think it was like November 2nd, an article drops on, on this uh, site called Coindesk and starts raising questions about the, the value for um, not only FTX, but they have sort of a sister organization which plays into the fraud called Alameda Research, which uh, Sam Bankman Fried had founded before FTX. And that was like an investment firm. And Theoretically, it was separate from FTX, but what we learned in the ensuing months was those two things were pretty intertwined, right? But when the, the article drops and raises questions about the, the capital basis from, for Alameda, people start to get nervous about the value of FTX tokens. And this gets complicated. I'll try and simplify it. But basically, just like we have Bitcoin, FTX had its own token, which was called FTT. And it was that was most of the assets on the balance sheet of Alameda. So when this comes out, people start to get nervous about the value of the FTT token. And then a few days after that article, one of FTX's main competitors, it's, it's another exchange, it's called Binance. They announced that they're liquidating all of their holdings in this FTT token because they have concerns, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, they have about $500 million of it. Uh, sitting on their books. So when they liquidate it, it's just like dump, flooding the market with it, the, the value of FTT tanks, right? And then that triggers what's basically like a bank run. Everybody starts panicking. Everybody who holds FTT is like, we've got to get our money out of there. The value's tanking. So over the course of about three days, FTX gets requests for roughly $6 billion in withdrawals and they can't meet it. Right. Mm -hmm. So now they're 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 in trouble. They're insolvent. So they panic. They go to Binance, who kind of started this whole thing. They mm -hmm. they work out a deal, say Binance buy us. That'll give us liquidity. We can meet our, our obligations and we'll be OK. They announce a plan. Then the next day, Binance comes out, presumably after having looked at their books and says, oh, we're backing out. We've got concerns about how customer funds are being handled. And then that's the end. So the article drops on November 2. On November 11th, FTX declares bankruptcy. In like less than two weeks, they go from $32 billion behemoth to zero. It was just the, the speed was remarkable. And then the kicker is at this point, we still don't really have a fraud angle. But then at this point, we start to learn, okay, well, there were serious uh, problems with commingling funds. FTX was taking customer deposits, lending them to Alameda to do invest, to make investments, right? To make trades. So mm -hmm. customers would think they're parking their money safely in FTX, but really it's being routed through this other uh, trading company that Sam Bankman Freed controls and they're making some speculative trades and stuff. And that's where we really get into fraud. So there's just a ton of stuff. It's huge. It's fast. You've got a, uh, a central character who's super interesting. And then you've got the fraud angle on top of it. So by December, he's arrested. He's charged with all these counts of fraud. And then, as you mentioned, uh, just a few weeks ago, he, he's convicted after a, a, a trial in New York. So I think we should probably mention that the Binance CEO has gotten into his own trouble with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Yeah, there's... um. This gets back to what I talked about, and I, I don't know enough about that case to comment on mm -hmm. it really, but this does get back to the, the idea that as of right now, the, the crypto market is a little bit unregulated. It's a little bit Wild Westy. And so mm -hmm. I think one of the fallouts from the FTX case is over the next few years, we're going to see a lot more of a push to regulate the industry, a lot more calls for transparency. Um, we're, we're seeing exactly what happened in this case, right? Like there's about $8 mm -hmm. billion, I've seen estimates, $8 billion, $9 billion, whatever, of customer funds that's just kind of gone away. And that's unacceptable, right? It's a massive mm -hmm. fraud. And we need to, clearly, we need to do a better job of, of regulating those markets and understanding what's happening 
uh, within these organizations that are holding customer money. Indeed. Um, so let's talk about our second most scandalous fraud and the sober housing scandal in Arizona, which caused a bunch of like Native American tribes to declare a public health emergency. So kind of like in this case, you know, there were these operators of sham sober housing facilities and they recruited people, you know, struggling with addiction from reservations across the U.S. West and to come to these addiction treatment facilities. But these fraudsters found a loophole in a Medicaid program for Native Americans in Arizona that allowed providers to get reimbursed for services, whether or not they actually rendered those services. So, um, John, what do you think about this case and, you know, what are some of the key takeaways that fraud examiners should take from this? Yeah, this one was kind of on, you know, when we talked about the the criteria we use to select scandalous frauds and, and one of them is the size and the amount of money lost. And that obviously applies uh, to FTX. And this one, there was a lot of money lost, too. But this one, it really is more about the, the human um toll that this took. It was, it was really a horrible case. It will kind yeah. of, you know, hurt your faith in humanity that these, <laughs> these uh, organizations were, were taking really vulnerable people who had problems with alcohol addiction and drug addiction, putting them in these, what they call sober homes and um, using it just purely as a way to build money out of Arizona's Medicaid operation. There, there were, what we've learned is there were pretty lax controls within that Medicaid program. There wasn't enough verification required um, about whether treatment was really being rendered to people, whether it was really being effective. And so you're, in terms of the dollar loss, I'll touch on the dollar loss first, just because it is substantial. We don't know exactly how much fraud there was, mm -hmm. um, but what we're, one of the things that raised alarm bells was um, in 2019, Arizona's uh, total Medicaid payments for substance abuse treatment was $53 million. Okay. That's in 2019. Three years later in 2022, that had jumped to $668 million. That's like an 11, 12 time increase. Right. And that was because people had found this loophole you mentioned and they exploited it. And so you've got groups going around soliciting people from all over the American West. It's not just Arizona targeting people in native American tribes, because that was how the, the Arizona program was set up to reimburse for, for um, those individuals, bring them in Arizona, putting them in these homes. In some cases there, there was not even a pretense of trying to treat alcoholism. They were given alcohol, they were given drugs. <laughs> yeah. uh, in some cases they were not allowed to leave. Some cases they were paid for staying in the homes as long as they turned over their Medicaid information so that the, the fraudsters could continue billing the program. It was a, a complete sham. I saw a report that 250 separate rehab providers have now been suspended pending an right. investigation. That gives you an idea of how many of these organizations were operating just within one state. It's a huge scandal. Somebody called it the biggest uh, government scandal in state history. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, there's there have been indictments so far. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a conviction yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But what it really tells us is what fraud examiners already know, which is you have to have controls. You have to know what your vendors are doing. The state can't be doling out money um, to providers without some sort of verification that yes, you are providing treatment services. Yes, it is effective. Yes, it's, it's a worthwhile expenditure of taxpayer money. In some ways, this looks a little bit like some of the frauds we saw during the pandemic, where mm -hmm. there was this massive outflow of government money and people swooped in and took advantage. What we know about fraudsters is when they see an opportunity, any weakness in your systems, you know, they'll exploit that weakness. In, in the, the COVID cases and in the pandemic relief cases, we could at least understand that money had to get out quickly. You know, there was a time component. Uh, in this, it, it's a little less understandable why the state didn't have tighter controls around its, um, around its Medicaid program. But they have, you know, at, at least reports are they have tightened that up now. They've placed caps on reimbursement, caps on reimbursements. They're doing background checks on providers and stuff. So hopefully this is going to start to go away, but it's a massive, massive scandal. Yeah. 
Um, so our third most scandalous fraud of the year was uh, is a United Nations report on human trafficking for cyber scams in Southeast Asia. And, you know, the U.N. says that there are these organized crime syndicates that are, you know, tricking people with job ads to come into these like cyber, like essentially these cyber scam centers to conduct the romance and inve- investment scams. And so I'm wondering what you, you know, you think about this and what fraud examiners really need to know about this case. Yeah, this one, you know, if the Arizona case makes you question humanity, this one kind of like convinces you that that <laughs> humanity is unredeemable. This one was yeah. really, really terrible. These, these yeah. were um, people basically being held you know, forced to do slave labor, committing fraud. It's so unusual, right? That the people committing the fraud are actually the victims in this case. And and what happens, as you mentioned, is these um, syndicates in in several Asian Pacific uh, countries, the, the ones that you hear the most about are Myanmar and in Cambodia and Laos, but I'm sure it's happening in other areas. But they're recruiting people from other countries the same way we've all heard about uh, human trafficking in other contexts, whether that's in, in, in the sex industry or, or in like forced labor. But they basically are going to people in, in other countries, typically in poorer regions, and promising jobs. You know, you come to this country, you'll get these good jobs, you get free housing, all these benefits. And then when the people arrive, they're essentially locked in a compound um, and put to work. And if they... Try their reports, people who tried to escape, they were caught, they were beaten severely. You know, they'd have their records taken away, passports taken away so they couldn't get home. Things like what, you know, again, what you hear in other trafficking cases. But what's so interesting in this case, they were just forced to commit Internet fraud schemes. Like you said, romance scams, investment scams and so forth. Um, It's very strange. I had I will confess um, I've been in the fraud industry for 28 years. I had never heard of this until this story broke. Right? I, I was not aware that this was really a problem. But when you read the news reports about it, you can understand why. Um, it's reported to be a multi-billion dollar industry. There, there are estimates that just one, it, 12 to 15 billion a year just in Cambodia from this industry. And what's happening is the syndicates who are running these operations, by all accounts, have ties to um, people with a lot of political influence. So there have been some raids, some crackdowns, but they've been largely ineffectual um, because there's political protection for these um, organizations at the highest levels of the governments. And, you know, they, they're clearly bringing a lot of money into um, those countries, I'm sure I, I don't have specific numbers, but I'm sure there's a lot of bribery and corruption going on in the law mm-hmm. enforcement uh, arena to make sure these continue to operate. But yeah, it's very, very terrible. The, the stories of people who are um, caught in this web are, are really heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, the other in- interesting thing is in other human trafficking scandals, they typically prey on less educated people, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. In this one, apparently, they're they're targeting primarily well-educated men uh, who have some, some technical skills, some mm-hmm. internet skill. Um, one of the theories, at least, is that part of what made this um, possible is after COVID, a lot of people lost their jobs, there was a lot of unemployment, and that um, made these folks susceptible to falling for these schemes. But whatever... Uh, the reason is it's still pretty serious and still ongoing. What I was reading, what I find interesting is that on the corruption angle is that, you know, the, these scams are actually propping up, you know, the military, the ruling military junta in Myanmar. So there's, you know, so there really isn't like the political will to fight these scams. Um, Yeah. And also on the point of the victims, you know, the women who are being trafficked for these scams are actually being used as like sex rewards for the men yeah. who are, you know, who are, you know, forced to commit the scam. So it's just a, just an just such a tangled mess of, you know, horrible yeah. 
loss to humans, but just such a big problem that would require, you know, international, you know, international cooperation to fight. Yeah, no, that's right. And it's a really good reminder, too, that, you know, sort of fraud begets fraud, that these are um, Internet fraud scams, what we would typically classify as a consumer scam. But they also um, involve human trafficking and they're also made possible because of government and political corruption. And so it's bribery begetting. Uh, internet fraud, which leads to more money, which allows more bribery, which draws. And and then when we see the numbers, the dollar figures that are being uh, driven by this, then you see like other bad actors entering the space. Right. Because this mm -hmm. is, you know, a, a new market for uh, criminal syndicates. I'm sure I, I don't I haven't actually seen a report, but I would be shocked if organized crime is not like behind uh, significant parts of this. And if they're not now, they'll move into the space because, again, the fraudsters go where the money is. And this seems to be where the money is right now. And if you've got protection like this um, and, and the other thing is, you know, they're not violent crimes. I don't again, I don't know anything about the uh, criminal, the penal codes in Cambodia. But in general, the potential penalties for nonviolent crimes, for financial crimes are lower. So if you're you know, this is we're seeing more and more organized crime moving out of sort of. Uh, violent criminal activities and into into more of the fraud space because there's actually less risk for them in many ways as well. Our fourth most scandalous fraud of the year is the MGM Caesars Palace cyber attacks. You know, for me, this case is pretty much everything that can go wrong with a cyber attack and especially how the hotel, like MGM was really, it caused so much havoc for guests. You know, because they had to shut everything down so people couldn't get into their rooms. They couldn't check in. They couldn't use the slot machines. So what are, you know, your thoughts on this case and what fraud examiners need to know about these cyber attacks? Yeah, this is really interesting. People who've been in, in the fraud space or in the cyberspace know this, but we say it all the time, but it always comes up to be true that um, your employees are the weakest link in your cyber defenses, right? MGM mm -hmm. and Caesars are multi-billion dollar organizations. They have incredibly sophisticated cyber defenses, financial defenses, and so forth, right? They are These are not mom and pop shops, right? They mm -hmm. know what they're doing. At the end of the day, they were undone by a scheme which called vishing, which we used to just call social engineering. But it's basically somebody made a call to the help desk and impersonated an employee. They found information about uh, an MGM employee, I believe, at, um, mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. They called the help desk. They pretended to be that employee. They got information which allowed them to access the system. And then once they got in, they were able to install ransomware. And so um, it's a good reminder that, you know, we talked before about the importance of awareness. It's awareness and training of your employees. All the, you can have all the firewalls you want and all the encryption systems you want. But at the end of the day, if an employee falls victim to a, a fraudster and gives away the secrets, you're still in trouble. Right. And so and mm -hmm. that's what happened here. It was it was this it was an incredibly simple scheme that um, took advantage of an incredibly complex organization. So. The other thing is the hackers in these cases apparently were using what's uh, software created by a, a group called Black Cat, which is I repeatedly Russian linked. But the fascinating thing is that organization operates what we call ransomware as a service model, right? Where they're just, they're basically selling ransomware and they take a cut of the proceeds. So now anybody who wants to commit a scheme like this they don't have to be a brilliant coder. They don't have to be a brilliant hacker. They don't have to know how to write this. They can just go on the dark web and buy it from some from a service provider the same way you'd buy word processing software or accounting software. So that's really troubling if you are a, a CFE or somebody who's who's working to defend your organization against these kinds of frauds. And again, it gets down to awareness, 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 training, training, training. You have to make sure... <laughs> You're eliminating those vulnerabilities within your people because that, that, you know, it's I, I sound like a broken record, but the fraudsters go after the weakest link, right? Wherever they mm -hmm. see an opportunity. And, and in this case, it was a person, 
And that, that is very often the case in these big, uh, these big frauds. Our fifth most scandalous fraud of the year is this billion, this billionaire Guo Wenwei, Chinese dissident. And, you know, I think this case had some similarities to FTX in on a much smaller scale. You know, you've got this alleged perpetrator who uses his connections to powerful people and his own celebrity to build trust and to get people to invest in his schemes. Um, he leveraged connections with uh, Donald Trump. He joined Mar-a-Lago so he can get close to who was the president at the time. Um, he befriended Steve Bannon, who was actually arrested on Woe's yacht in 2020 for his own uh, fraud scheme, the We Build the Wall scheme. Yeah, if you're an old timer like me, this one was almost comforting in a way because we know this, this is like this is sort of a straight up investment swindle, right? This is mm-hmm. like the it's like the classics, right? We love the classic, but this was just a guy who created the appearance of wealth. He cultivated influential friends. He um, worked with Steve. I should mention, by the way, Steve Bannon wasn't implicated in this case. Yeah, um, that's right. Right. He, 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 mm-hmm. the, the arrest on Will's yacht was for a completely different case. So there's nothing implicating Bannon in this case right now. But, um, I think having that connection to Steve Bannon probably gave him a level of, of, uh, credibility. He was somebody who'd come from China, uh, a few years before. He'd been in trouble in China for bribery yes. and corruption. Mm-hmm. And, and when he got to the U.S. by way of England, <clears throat> he, um, became a very outspoken critic of China. And uh, the Chinese Communist Party and and looked like somebody who was, you know, a, a well off capitalist who, who'd come to the West to sort of make his fortune. As it turns out, that wasn't the case. He was a huckster. He uh, used his influence with um, Steve Bannon to start something called GTV, which was uh, some sort of Internet you know, news or information venture. But he he basically told people this thing was worth billions of dollars. He sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investments uh, to people. And it turned out to be a a sham that had no revenue. Um, The government has charged him with 11 counts of fraud, money laundering, conspiracy. The uh, the U.S. government's already seized about $730 million of fraud proceeds from his bank accounts. And there's a separate charge uh, for $250 million from a separate scheme he was running. Mm -hmm. So, you know, totals up to about a billion dollars, but it was just a good old fashioned investment swindle. And he's been charged and I think goes to trial in the spring of 2024. He's pled not guilty right now, uh, but the evidence doesn't look great for him. So we'll be keeping an eye on this and see what Mm -hmm. happens in 2024. Yeah, I believe his trial starts in April. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so I think there'll be more forthcoming on him. And just just the the hallmarks of a typical um, big investment, you know, fraud. He was using he was living a really lavish lifestyle. He's buying yachts and million dollar, hundred million dollar mansions and sports cars and um, you know, like anybody who remembers the uh, the one MDB and the the Joe Lo, uh, the guy who's sort of at the center of that. It's very similar to that in the way he was he was living this high rolling lifestyle just just off of um, fake investments. And the funny thing about fraudsters in these cases is that I I never, I never quite understand. They have to know it's going to come to an end, right? If you get Mm -hmm. a billion dollars in investments and you're spending it all on your own stuff, you have to know there's going to come a point in time where somebody says, where's the business? Where's the company? Where's the revenue? And I don't know what they think. But they mm-hmm. just seem to it seems to be this sort of short term thinking where they're living the high life and we'll worry about it later. And, you know, April is later, it sounds like. Out of all of these cases that we've discussed today, do you have a do you have a scandal or do you have a fraud that scandalized you the most? I think obviously it's a human trafficking case, right? Mm-hmm. Like as big as the other cases were and and um, as terrible as they were, the um the human trafficking just touches a whole other level. You're talking about putting people into slavery. You're talking about like really ruining, you know, by all accounts, hundreds of thousands of people have been caught up in these trafficking scandals. 
um, related to the internet frauds. And, uh, and that the other thing that's really horrible about that is it doesn't seem like we're close to ending it. The, the, that seems to be an ongoing problem and looks like it will be for a while. So to me, that is the one that's the most scandalous. Did you have one? I do. Um, the human trafficking one for sure, but I do think about the sober homes one a lot. Like it just, for some reason, it just, you know, pops up in my head from time to time. And I think there's something about going after such a vulnerable and marginalized population. And I think that, you know, there are many people around the world who have loved ones who are suffering with addiction. So you can just think about, you know, somebody I love getting caught up in a fraud like yeah. this. And just No, that's exactly know, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the human trafficking case and the sober home scandal, the it's like a reminder that with fraud, it's not just, you know, these faceless large organizations that are getting hurt. It's actually like real people who get hurt by fraud. That's a really good point. It's also a reminder. I think um, if you're a CFE, your day-to-day -day work, you know, so uh, any kind of work can become tedious and you do the same thing over and over and you're, but it, it really is a reminder that the work we do is important, right? And it, you know, it serves a high purpose. This isn't just a job. These are people's lives who get ruined by these schemes and anything we can do to catch the bad guys, to identify these frauds, to prevent them from happening in the first place. We're, you know, we're not just saving money, we're saving lives sometimes. So I think um, it's an opportunity for CFEs to feel good about the profession they've chosen and the work they do. Indeed. Well, thank you, John. And thank you for listening. You can find this podcast along with all other episodes of Fraud Talk on acfe.com, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been Jen Liebman signing off.